Hello, and welcome everyone. Um, let me start with a, a before and an after. Uh, before the talk, right now actually, uh, please turn off all your devices. And after the talk, please come see Professor Riley's actual work and join us for a reception in the Jaffe Friedi Gallery right next door, well, that way, <laughs> in the um, Hopkins Center uh, Gallery. I'm studio art professor Louise Hamlin. Um, I have the great good fortune to know Enrico Riley since he was a student and then an intern in our department. In fact, I always show my etching class some work he left behind in a print shop drawer. A self-portrait drawing made on a folded paper towel, you know, the kind you get right out of the wall dispenser, those brown paper towels. He did an ink drawing self-portrait, which he then transformed into a dry point etching on copper. <laughs> I still have it and show it to every class. <laughs> um, and I mention it not only because his talent was clear, from a very, even from a very casual ink drawing done in his youth on throwaway paper, um, but also because it demonstrates the spirit of inquiry and experimentation that's always informed his work and afforded him a great range of subject and style. Professor Riley has been an esteemed colleague at Dartmouth since 2001. Currently our department chair, he handles this thankless job with his signature grace under pressure and genuine concern for all. Those of you who've taken classes with him or heard him talk know how attentive he is to the many layers of significance and achievement in art. He addresses art of the past with the same thoughtful insight as that of current students and peers. This has not gone unnoticed and he has given talks and critiques in dozens of schools across the country. His work has been exhibited in galleries and museums also all across the country and been included in several important collections and received a great deal of critical attention. His awards are many, beginning at Yale Graduate School where he received a Philip Morris Fellowship and Shulkoff Travel Prize. Among subsequent awards are a purchase prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters and a Guggenheim Fellowship. And he has just returned from a year in Italy at the American Academy in Rome as a winner of the prestigious Rome Prize. Making art is absolutely central to Professor Riley's life. He draws every day, works at home when that's the available option, and in his studio as often as possible. And I've seen for myself that when time is short and pressures many, his Dartmouth office becomes a makeshift studio. While consciously linked to the history of art, music, science, and culture, his work remains deeply personal. He has said that, quote, painting for me is formal, but the formal decisions have to be deployed through something else, need, desire, or appetite, end quote. His paintings and drawings move fluidly between personal and formal, abstraction and representation, wit and horror, delight and despair, curiosity and knowledge. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor Enrico Riley. <laughs> um, just one second here. Um, Louise, thanks so much for that really kind and generous introduction. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would just want to thank Gerald Otten, the director of the exhibition program, uh, my colleagues uh, in the studio art exhibition, uh, rather at the studio art department here at Dartmouth College, um, the students here at Dartmouth College, um, uh, uh, and friends and family. Um, now, I would like to, to, to not say really anything about uh, this current body of work, but I know that I cannot do that, uh, and I, ha I have to, to say some, some words. Um, uh, so what I want to do is to um, go through a bunch of images, um, both of my, my work, uh, the work I'm doing now, uh, some historical antecedents, um, uh, and other uh, other images that will serve to situate you um, 
uh, and serve to help you uh, reference the work. I think there are many things that I'm thinking about uh, and I'm interested with regards to painting um, and drawing and making art in general. I'm interested in materials. I'm interested in how the paint feels, uh, how you can apply it, uh, how you can take it off. I'm interested in the sequence of operations that yields uh, the needed effect uh, for a passage in a painting. I'm also interested in the history of painting and how the past and the contemporary bend time and space and speak to each other. I'm very much interested uh, in ideas, and ideas in their linkedness to the physical world of materials and perception. Please feel free to ask questions um, as I'm talking, um, and hopefully we can uh, move this, this lecture into more of a conversation at the end. The painting on the screen is a, is a good example uh, of what I'm doing in my recent work. There are aspects to this painting and to the new works that are clear and do not need any explanation. They can be read as political, about social justice, about violence, about race and vulnerability. They are indeed about all of these things and more. They are about things that I myself am not completely sure of. And even though they might present a clear and kind of subject and point to a known narrative, these narratives inside of the paintings are not clearly known to me. This is called Untitled, a very old game revisited. There is a figure diving for cover. There is an escape happening. There is nakedness and vulnerability. There is danger. There are many against one. There is the giving of the black figure his sexuality. There is a tension between the gun barrels and the figure. The metaphor of water, water inverted into sky, water. The beauty of the day, the violence of the action. The inference of the sun and the passage of time, the timelessness of the action, the soothing of the blue, the black body as infinite receptor. The title of this exhibition and this body of work is called Infinite Receptors. It comes from an idea that by nature of the identifying characteristic of dark skin pigmentation, the black body is consistently seen as other in the modern Western social apparatus. This coupled with its historical definition as subhuman and therefore open to acts of violence, mistreatment, and marginalization has forged it into an object of infinite reception. One look at the American media shows it can be acted upon and projected upon even by authorities in the most violent ways. It can be given superhuman strength, sexuality, or sensitivity. Clearly then, creative parallels can be drawn between the Judeo-Christian narratives as expressed through the paintings that represent them. For example, the simple visual act of placing a halo around the head of a saint, disciple, or Jesus symbolizes them conceptually as other. These same bodies are then depicted in these paintings as being persecuted for their otherness through acts of flagellation, crucifixion, beheadings, burnings, etc., or as superhuman through acts of communing with God through earth and animal. My intention, however, is not to insert black bodies into set biblical themes, but rather to tap into the emotional experience expressed visually through them. In this work, I'm presenting the black body as symbolic and its experiences as both symbolic and iconic. These paintings attempt also to show the larger issues of human suffering 
and mistreatment that affect us all. Here's an example of a painting that I'm engaged with uh, that, is, that is in the canon of Western art history. Um, it is a painting by the 14th century Italian artist Giotto and is depicting a deposition scene. As you can see, you can see all the symbolic uh, coding of the various figures with that attached uh, halo. In this new work, there not only are historical antecedents that inform them, uh, but also past objects within my own body of work. This painting is called Abstract. He loved her madly. She jumped into the sea. This painting precedes the new work by about seven months. As you can see, the motif for some of the newer paintings is coming right from uh, this earlier work. Here the color uh, is more garish, overtly abstract, and therefore fantastical. The male and female figures are played against each other. This is a painting about bathers, about romance, about the velocity of love and attraction. It also points back to the tradition of genre paintings about bathers. Here's a painting by Edward Manet that I'm interested in. A painting by Paul Cezanne, bather. Picasso, another take on this theme and even a contemporary painter, a painter named Catherine Bradford, who also is engaged in this kind of subject matter. I'm driving this point home to show you that even though the new paintings are about contemporary issues, they arrive at these issues through a nonlinear and indirect route. What proceeds they're making are many things. Last year, my wife and two children and I spent 10 months living in Rome, Italy. We had a chance to travel around Italy quite a bit, both north and south. Uh, but this is what we left behind. This is Vermont. This is a little bit north of here. Um, and this is, this is sort of the environment that, uh, that I'm used to seeing. And this is what greeted us in Rome. Uh, the, the close building is the, the actual American Academy, and we're looking off of the, the porch of my studio. The far building uh, is what they called 5B, and it's where half of the families stayed, where half of the, the fellows with families stayed. At the American Academy, I had a chance to devote a lot of time to just painting and drawing and interacting with the other fellows. My intention was to look at medieval and Baroque painting, but when I got there, what I found more interesting was the architecture. There's a tradition in the Mediterranean of plastering over the stone and brick substructure with plaster and stucco. And this, this overcoating uh, accepts light in a very interesting way and allowed me to see the architectural forms in Rome very clearly. Living in Rome was also like living in a giant Picasso collage. There are so many different textures and styles, uh, time periods, all competing for attention, and you're living with them all. Here's an everyday example of what you might see in Rome. So the Pantheon is about 800 maybe 800 feet to the left of this view, but you have the remnants of an ancient temple. You have an eighth century basilica, this white building here, 
I'm not sure of the time frame of this Siena colored building. Uh, it's either medieval uh, or maybe 17th or 18th century. 20th century architecture, a little kiosk, uh, a newsstand, contemporary cars, uh, et cetera, all, all smashed up against each other. This is one of my current paintings. The last slide might uh, give you an idea as to how I'm thinking about structuring these paintings, primarily through interruptions, assertions, and cropping. This is called Untitled Evening Shakedown. A relief from Palazzo Altemps, again, uh, something that I would see almost on a daily, uh, a daily basis. Overlapping forms, shallow space, the play of light over the image, interruptions and assertions. The left image here shows that plaster and stucco uh, over, over sort of um, information, material information. And here's the brick substrate. Uh, it's amazing to go through Rome and see these ancient walls and see the brick, uh, see the vegetation beginning to take hold in them, and then also see uh, what the original intention was. And here again is an example uh, of the past and present coming together um, through this graffiti, uh, Andrea, apparently that he, he wanted to, he felt compelled to scratch his name into, um, into one of the forum, the forum walls. Here's a doorway in Lintel from Herculaneum, uh, a town next to Pompeii that also was destroyed uh, by Mount Vesuvius. Africans living in Naples. This is in Naples, Italy. Finally, here's another really good example of the idea of Rome for me uh, acting and feeling like a giant collage. Uh, on the left, you have the remnants of Ponte Emilio. All you have left is that last arch and the two supports. Um, it was made in, uh, I think, 140 BC. Uh, it's one of the older bridges, if not the oldest one in Rome. And it was flooded and destroyed uh, all the way up until uh, the 1800s. At that point, they built uh, this bridge, uh, Palato, or rather uh, Ponte Palantino, um, and they left, <laughs> they just left the bridge there. Um, and they do that a lot in Rome. Um, being at the academy and talking to uh, some of the, the archaeologists um, and medievalists, uh, I became to, became to realize that uh, there was a whole tradition in ancient Rome to recycling, uh, building materials for new projects, uh, and also, by extension, leaving up the remnants um, of abandoned uh, uh, architectural forms because it was much cheaper just to leave them up uh, as opposed to, to demoing them. Um, uh, so you have all of these, this type of information in Rome, all of these interruptions um, and assertions. So, Further to contextualize the new work, uh, the idea of drawing. This is a drawing that's about 17 years old. Uh, drawing is extremely, extremely important to me. Um, I did this drawing in Vermont. While I was living in Philadelphia, I came up to visit a friend. And at this point for me, uh, what's really interesting isn't so much um, the forest and the trees, which at the time was the thing that was interesting to me. Uh, uh, getting out of Philadelphia for a little bit and, and being up here. Um, what now becomes interesting to me uh, are the pictorial forces that are in the drawing. Um, and those sort of revolve around the idea of motion and stillness. So, oops, let's go ahead. 
So this kind of progression, uh, just from here to here to here, and the way it's picked up here, and the way we might move into the center of the drawing and begin to rotate around, and maybe start to feel a sense of perspective uh, through here. Uh, so really what I'm just trying to say is uh, there's a feeling of space in the drawing for me um, that, that I'm interested in at this point. This is a drawing that's a couple years old, and it's part of this new body of work. And even though the materials are the same, uh, they're both done in crayon on paper, um, and they, they both maybe start in the middle. This one you drop down here, and then push up and come around and back to the middle. Maybe, for me at least, that's how I circulate around that drawing. The difference, though, between this drawing and the last drawing is that I know very intimately how the drawing process, how this drawing will yield, yield a painting. And that's really um, a, big, a, big, a big development, um, uh, a, a big realization for me. This is the painting that comes from that drawing. It's called Untitled Remembrance of Things Present. It's about 61 by 74 inches. The drawing is about eight and a half by 11. Here's another drawing. Going all the way back to that idea of the divers and bathers and taking that form and contextualizing it uh, with this rope and then forming the rope in a way that reminds us of a noose. And then all of a sudden, our minds start to think of something maybe more sinister than just someone jumping into water or someone hanging around uh, for pleasure on a rope. Possibly there's some motion. There's some slight swaying. You know, having the center axis slightly diagonal uh, more leaning to the left at the top and more leaning to the, to the right at the bottom. Motion and stillness uh, I see in Mirandi. This is a painting of his from 1947. For me, uh, the idea of motion and stillness almost happens as if you're looking through something, looking through uh, water or some kind of humidity. And that's just an amazing, uh, amazing painting that moves around and circulates and doesn't sit still, and also sits very still. It's a Philip Guston still life, borrowing from Mirandi. The motion and stillness might express itself through a progression from left to right. A drawing by Bill Trailer. Um, an African-American born into slavery, uh, um, an untrained artist. Lots of motion, lots of dancing, lots of things going, going on. But let's look at that, the arm and the leg and the foot coming together in that beautiful negative space, and that negative space, and that, and that. And that, it's, it's brilliant. Um, it's brilliant. And then also trying to see this stuff in real life, just trying to see and um, pay attention to these ideas uh, of pictorial forces. So again, uh, maybe the subject matter might be about bathers, or it might be about the ocean. But if we look closely, we can see my son Alex's foot slightly pushing down the wet sand and slightly starting to get a ridge here and talking about the force of his weight pushing into the earth. And then my daughter's Etienne, uh, her foot just barely off the ground. And she's jumping in the air, celebrating the sea. And it's almost as if, as if Alex stepped on the ground and it pushed her up in the air. And that's the kind of thing that is the subject matter as much as the bather, as much as the ocean. But 
a really amazing, amazing sculpture in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. It's a Greek sculpture uh, from about 300 BC. It's, uh, it's been called Lion Attacking Horse. Originally, uh, it was in its original form. This is not the original form. You can see where uh, it's been restored. It was restored in Rome in the 1500s. The head was knocked off. All four legs were knocked off. Um, for a long time, all that, that uh, existed was the torso of the horse and the lion. I didn't know this was a famous sculpture when I was over in Rome. And then um, I had the great fortune of hearing an artist named Charlie Ray talk about this sculpture. And I was like, oh, I know this sculpture. And I had taken some photos of it. And I knew that there was something uh, very interesting about the sculpture, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Charlie talked about it in some other, some other ways. For me, um, it's a great illustration of this transfer of force. The subject matter might be about uh, some emotional turmoil, some, court, some sort of great action, uh, but the flex in the arm, the slight slight tautness and pulling of the skin in the marble. And marble and stone doesn't do that. It doesn't pull. It, it, it's inert. And so there's this whole conversation about the force of this animal relaying that force onto this animal, onto this body. Here's a detail of the paw. Now quickly, I'm just going to run through uh, just a few more historical antecedents, and then we'll, we'll see um, much more of the newer work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Philip Guston. Uh, he's a really important and amazing painter um, uh, for contemporary painters. Uh, some people really like him. Um, uh, some people really don't. Uh, but he's really quite, uh, um, quite an important painter. I just want to show how Philip Guston was a collector. He was a collector literally. I think he would go to um, yard sales and gather all kinds of junk and material and bring it to his studio. But he also was a collector of objects in art history. Uh, this is the tomb and monument in Testaccio in Rome, uh, just across the Tiber from where I was staying. Um, this is the old ancient wall, part of the old ancient wall. This is a painting from the 1970s uh, called Pyramid in Shoe. And you can see how the Romans borrowed from the Egyptians, and then Gustin borrowed from the Romans. He was a Jewish American painter uh, and was dealing, um, dealing with, with, with a lot of those issues um, uh, that comes along uh, with his eth eth ethnicity, uh, even though he might, he, he might not have talked about it um, overtly or specifically. Here's another painting called Aggressor, again from the 70s. And this is a Giotto fresco. And right over here, you can see where Gustin gets the composition from. And you can see just right here these two figures almost headbutting each other. Fra Angelico, he decorated San Marco in Florence. Uh, San Marco is probably the most beautiful entity, thing in Italy. Uh, it's a medieval cloister, and Fra Angelico was uh, a brother there in that cloister, and um, he also happened to be a great artist. And he would go through and uh, do these decorations uh, from the life of Christ or the life of Mary. Uh, in these individual cells. And so you walk into this place and uh, you peer into these little rooms where the, where the monks were, and they have these tremendously amazing frescoes uh, on the walls. This is the mocking of Christ, completely contemporary, disembodied heads and hands. Uh, this is a Roman, I think, spitting, if you know the story, uh, spitting on the Christ figure. Tremendous uh, painting. 
Tom and Jerry from the 1940s, um, the roundness of those cartoons, um, the slowness of the cartoons, the idea of humor, the idea of humor and violence linked together. Also, the, the racial undertones of some of these, uh, some of these cartoons. Um, for those of us who are old enough, uh, you remember the mammy figure. You would usually just see, you just see her feet usually uh, at the bottom uh, uh, in some of these cartoons. Most of that stuff has been edited out now. So a lot, a lot of us, if you're a little bit younger, you probably don't see them uh, anymore in the cartoons, but uh, you can certainly find them online. This is a new painting called Untitled Flagellation, False Confession. Untitled Midnight Hunting. These are all large, about 60 by 64 inches. Untitled Resting Two. There's a resting one. A drawing, I think this drawing is in the exhibition. Um, most of the drawings that are in the exhibition, all the ones that I've shown tonight, are actually about eight and a half by 11. Um, I just cropped in on these so you can get a sense of the detail. All the drawings are untitled. I do them mostly at night, uh, in bed before I go to sleep. Uh, sometimes I get one done, sometimes I get three or four or five. Uh, and it's really interesting to wake up and sort of try to remember and see uh, what happened the night before. I also do them in my, my office, in my studio, but um, the really magic ones seem to happen at night in the bed. The drawings all precede the paintings. Uh, the drawings are always happening, and from them, either cobbling a drawing uh, together uh, with another drawing um, or just a single drawing, I'll start to generate uh, a painting. This is called Remembrance of Things Past. This is called Untitled Respect. And just an example of a drawing to a larger painting and how that drawing might move into painted form. This is called Evening Together We Can Do Anything. It's about 40, 50 inches by 70 inches. I stumbled upon this body of work in 2014 when a lot of police videos were being shared around the country. And to be really honest, it just got under my skin. It, be it began to bother me, and I began to ask sort of how and why. Um, and I began to think about that subject matter more than my previous subject matter, and so I knew that it was time to paint. I knew it was time to paint about it. Um, and the drawings came, came first, about six months earlier. Uh, and then I began to figure out how to make them into paintings. In Rome, uh, one unexpected uh, interesting thing that happened was I formed a collaboration with the composer Jonathan Berger. Uh, we started to put images of my drawings together um, with, with music, with his compositions. We worked on about three projects together. One is, is about to happen now. Um, this is just a still shot of one of our projections that's on the facade of the American Academy. That's about 50 feet tall by about 75 feet wide. Um, and, uh, and it's been interesting to sort of 
see the drawings have a new, a new life and to actually start to, to make art in a slightly different form. I'm just going to play you just a little bit, uh, maybe five minutes of our first project together. The video shows a sequence of drawings, they fade in and out, uh, and this is one of Jonathan's compositions. Uh, it's, a, it's a composition that he had already made and had already been performed, but we paired it um, with the drawings, and uh, subsequently we've been working on um, collaborations that are more interactive, where he's making compositions and I'm making drawings in relation to an idea.
I think this might be the last, this might be the last slide actually. So this might be a good, a good place to end. Um, I'd love to have any questions and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks very much for your time. So if anybody has a question, don't be shy. <laughs> Can you pass that to me? Um, sorry, who did you say you were working with in like uh, cooperation to make those uh, pieces together? Um, a composer, his name is Jonathan Berger. Okay. Uh, he teaches out at Stanford University. Um, he's a little older than, than me. Uh, yeah. Okay. So when you two make those um, like pieces and then put them together, is it more like um, you make something and you make something in response, or vice versa, or? Um, so you're talking about the collaborative pieces with sound. Yes. Um, so the first piece we did, um, uh, we sequenced a bunch of drawings, and uh, and he had again he had a pre-existing um, composition that was already performed, uh, and we put them together. And they sort of uh, wound up being like these very crude animations in a way, um, very slow uh, animations. Um, our next project, uh, we actually were working together as part of a, a larger group. We were staging a puppet show uh, in Rome. And there were uh, some visual components and some musical components. Um, but he and I worked together to coordinate those two things. And they actually operate sort of separate from uh, this this puppet show, which was uh, a retelling of the Italian Vespers, the, um, the liberation uh, of Sicily. Uh, and the final piece that we're working on, uh, or the current one, is called I Can't Breathe. It's actually going to be um, performed at Stanford for the uh, Daniel Pearl Memorial Concert, uh, which happens every October um, at Stanford. And with that piece, we set up a Dropbox account and we talked about conceptually what we were going to do. Um, and I started making drawings and putting them in the Dropbox. And then he would start uh, to put together musical sounds and compositions uh, and put those recordings in the Dropbox and I could hear them. And then we would both go back and forth uh, utilizing this shared, this shared file. Um, the original form of that piece is all digital music. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but um, uh, but Jonathan is is um, transforming uh, that digital music uh, to take on I think a couple of tenors, uh, so voice uh, and a string quartet. Um, so it's actually going to be um, both a combination of digital music and acoustic music. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh huh. Here's a mic. Hi. Hey. How are you doing? Would you um, speak a little bit, would you mind speaking a little bit about the, um, uh, on the shield in the last painting, the, yeah. the figure that also appears uh, elsewhere? Yeah. And, and also, um, if you would, a little on the, about the wall, which we see in that, um, the old painting that you showed early uh, of uh, Christ, and you know, I'm I'm talking about the wall in, in your paintings, and I sort of I saw that. I see. Old okay. Painting. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't even. Know. Let's see if I can. I'm afraid to try to even <laughs> uh, go into this, um, but I I think I know what you're talking about. Um, the um, the emblem on that shield um, is a reference to um, the three clubs, sort of th three clubs that you also saw um, uh, in an earlier painting of, a, of a, a person sort of with their head in their hands. And you saw that, that same configuration behind that figure. Um, uh, I transferred it to put on, to signify, um, who, who the left side of the painting was representing. 
Um, that painting was done last spring, uh, or just this past spring before um, any of the recent events that have happened recently. Uh, um, here, uh, that painting was done in Italy. Um, it's a, it has a reference to medieval painting. There, and a, a lot of times there are situations where you'll, you'll have um, swords or spears or clubs that are all sort of uh, crisscrossing against each other. You also find that in Philip Guston paintings. He'll transfer that to um, the handles of, of paint brushes <laughs> and paint cans, but he'll set them up the same way. For me, I'm using it to show um, violence, and I'm sort of branding, putting a brand, a symbol on that shield, um, a generalized idea of violence. Um, there's a gun barrel also on that left side of that painting. Um, for me, the, the wall, um, I think of them more as, fen as like fences, like wooden fences. Um, uh, and to be honest, it's more of a formal device. It's a way to sort of crop out and a way to, to organize the picture plane. Um, uh, it also, um, sort of after the fact, I began to think about it with regards to theater um, and the idea of theater um, and the idea of a stage and a backdrop. Um, so I, I sort of think about it in that way. Is that? Oh, okay. There's a few more mic. questions. Um, I was wondering, in your time at Rome, surrounded by all the other fellows there, how that influenced your work? Uh, I'm still figuring that out. Um, so you, you go there as an artist, and there are four artists, and then there's like, I mean, you, Taria, you know. Um, and then there are maybe 30 other academics, uh, art historians, uh, archaeologists, medievalists, um, architects. Um, I was really the only painter there. Uh, there were two other sculptors and then a video artist. Um, but we, we all had amazing conversations um, about Rome specifically, or about the Mediterranean, or um, conceptually what Rome sort of meant, or just trying to figure out uh, as a group what, what this place was. Because uh, so, some of the people there had been there before, and their research uh, is in Rome or in Italy. But many of us uh, had not spend, uh, uh, spent a long amount of time there. Um, so you get there, and it's like, uh, it's really disorienting. Um, to the point of where I actually had to not go out into the city for like the first six weeks so that I could actually get work done and establish uh, a rhythm in the studio because there is just so much to see there um, and so much to do uh, and it's just so visually overwhelming. So all of the fellows, I think we are all vibing on that and, uh, and uh, you know, their ideas and their observations um, were things that <coughs> Oops, that, uh, that influenced me. Any other questions? Hi. Hey, Craig. Um, so I have a question about paint. Yes. And um, I think what's interesting in these is they are so content heavy that we yes. are going to tend to go to them thinking about content. We're going First. to respond to them in that way. Yes. But the way they're made is through paint and through your thinking processes is coming about through paint. Right. So could you talk something about the, 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 the thinking process of, of painting? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a great question. So, um, you know, I was trying to talk about maybe in a more generalized way about pictorial forces and the sort of formal information um, that uh, as an artist, you, you train yourself to, to to notice and it allows you to travel through time and look at different kinds of art and glean information from it. Um, these paintings are um, extremely formal. So um, there might be the uh, illusion that um, I am in some emotional frothy state as I am making them, but I am not. <laughs> I am thinking about formal issues. Color, light, form, uh, 
uh, materiality surfaces, um, superimposition, putting one object in front of another to make space, uh, really trying to make space in the most efficient, um, clearest way possible, in a way. Uh, and then there's just the sort of tactile relationship with, with material, with putting paint down. Um, so they are extremely content heavy. Uh, and um, for those of you who come over into the exhibition, you'll see that they're actually physical. They're worked on. They're, um, there's nuance. Uh, they're not just about the image. Uh, and I think that's a way, um, uh, you know, to have them maybe last a little while and to have them not just be about um, the sort of overt context, um, the, 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 the uh, content. The content wants to be fused with the formal interaction that we as painters or artists have with the materials. Uh, and for the students, that's why we're like telling you to like draw these line drawings and sculpt this and do that. So you gain a relationship so that you can be free and you can you know, try to put down um, what you're thinking about, but also have it come through a language and embed yourself in a tradition. Yes. OK. OK. I wanted to address the frothy state that you're not in. Yes. <laughs> uh, whenever I take a class with you or I engage with your work, I feel as though I'm experiencing everything beautiful and everything awful at all at the same time, yeah. which is why I love taking your classes, because I feel as though all the thoughts that I think at the same time you are also dealing with. Yep. And I want to better understand how you f feel like you control being an infinite receptacle yourself of everything beautiful and everything awful at the same time. That's a complicated question. <laughs> um, the one thing that I will say is that I can't get in the way of you making your art. Uh, so I might be your instructor, but what I think about myself can't uh, prevent you from being wh who you need to be through your art. And, and similarly, I, can, I, I have to try to get out of the way of, um, of my own art, you know? I think it's a matter of, of um, um, you know, of course, I'm emotionally disturbed, uh, and I and I think about those things a lot, uh, and and I do think about those things, um, these issues while I'm while I'm painting, but not all the time. And I wouldn't even say, um, in the act of painting, um, I'm thinking about painting. It's like I have to get out of the way. And then when I'm done, I can really sit down and reflect. Or, um, um, you know, when we're in class together, uh, um, you know, at some point maybe I can become more relaxed uh, and show you more of, of, of personally who I am. But my main job is to, is to, is to not get in the way. Um, that's, that's my main job. Well, this is going to sound so simplistic, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, I know that you mentioned that you have a lot of formal considerations mm -hmm. in your painting. And the one uh, detail you showed was of the paw, the paw of the lion. Yeah. Right. And as I looked at your paintings, I was wondering why there's always three digits on Yeah. <laughs> why? Yeah. Is it a convention that you've come up with, or yeah, have you? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a way, um, so it's, it's a way to talk about an overt fiction. Um, it's a way for everyone to know that, um, that uh, these aren't sort of like real people. Um, but uh, at the same time, trying to get us to identify, to identify with the figure. Um, so it's, it's a way, in some ways, it's a way of softening um, some of the content. Uh, it's a nod towards cartooning uh, in that Tom and Jerry 
still shot. Tom just has three, three big, big toes there. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm, you know, for me personally, um, I'm not as interested in um, the specifics of realism, which uh, there are some artists that that is where they love to be. That is, that is what really makes them want to paint or sculpt. Um, for me, uh, it's not located right in that area. Um, so I hope that, okay. Any other questions? Uh, Brenda, yes. Hi. Hey, can you talk about how your palette changed with the new book? Yeah. Um, so there's a question about um, the palette, the choice of colors, and how that changed from some of the older work to now. Um, I just showed one painting of the older work, and it was they were really bright and exuberant, um, uh, and one might say ecstatic. Uh, um, in those paintings, I think I was always trying to make uh, those forms um, have more volume, and it's something that. Uh, you know, I've, I, I talk to my students about it's something that we actually do in class. We actually start with this palette, the earth palette. Um, this is more or less an earth palette, and then move to a more chromatic palette. Um, but that earth palette, these, these sort of closer, more simplified uh, colors, allows me to focus on value uh, and tone uh, in a much more specific way. So I can start to, to think about um, a different kind of harmony. Uh, in the painting, um, and it sort of, hopefully it sort of puts the attention on the actual form, um, as opposed to, uh, I think I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, so Brenda's asking, um, is there a link to the skin, uh, to the skin tone, to blackness? And yes, and it's a funny story. It's a funny story. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was working on that body of work, and I showed that the one painting with the green and the two figures. Um, and I had misjudged how much paint I was going to use in, in that body of, of work. And so um, I ran out of paint. I ran out of all those colors that I normally use. But I wanted to explore this idea of, of, uh, of this diving figure. Um, and it's, it's sort of still sort of here. Um, so I had a bunch of earth, earth colors. And they're the kind of colors that you sort of uh, collect and you sort of have a lot of and you sort of don't use them a lot. And they're just sort of sitting around. Uh, and I began to paint uh, uh, these new paintings. And as soon as I started to paint them with an umber uh, color, um, the paintings immediately be became, they, they became about race. They had to become about race because they were talking about a depiction uh, of something relatively naturalistic. So I had to then really sit down and think about um, whether I wanted to proceed with this or whether I would wait till my other paints came and then crawl back into my hole and say, okay, I'm not gonna touch that. But um, I was compelled. I was compelled to keep going. You're welcome, Brenda. <laughs> so I, I have, a, um, I guess, a formal question also, and that's between the, can you talk a little bit more about the connection between the drawings and the paintings? Because the drawings seem to be small and in black and white or monochromatic. Yeah. And the paintings are very large and very chromatic. Yeah. And I'm wondering um, what compels those two changes when you go to the painting and if you ever bring the two things back and make large drawings with lots of color or small paintings with just black and white. What's the... Yeah. For the most, for the most part, the drawings... Um, they started off in notebooks, and then I'd fill a notebook, and then I'd cut the drawings out. And it was all about portability, you know, being able to draw anywhere and sort of let your mind, you know, empty out in that way. Um, 
In Rome, I started to work on some larger format drawings. Uh, but there's a real, um, what I found out, I knew, but I really found out when I started to, to try to make these larger drawings, um, you have to get a really big crayon. You have to find a really big crayon to have the same effect on a large sheet of paper that I'm getting uh, on those smaller sheets of paper. So I found some litho crayons. There's a company in uh, Chicago that sells relatively large litho crayons. And I was able to sort of get that information into a larger size drawing. Um, I've tried to paint some of these paintings smaller, and they don't work. I can't figure it out. Um, they're sort of awful. Uh, there's, there's, there's something about the size that I, I need to sort of spread out. And when I'm dealing with color, I sort of need this extra space to figure things out. Um, hopefully, at some point, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know. You know, maybe I'll figure it out on a smaller scale. Um, I think the thing that holds me back is that I don't want these paintings are made in a way where the paint is relatively thin, and um, they're consciously not talking too much about painterliness, um, and uh, and um, and I think the only way or the way that I can think about making them small is if I painted them wet into wet and painted them like drawings. Um, and I, I'm just resisting doing that. Um, so yeah. A couple more questions. Uh, I see Dande, and then um, I think Um, my question is just, who would you say your work is for? And I mean that in the sense of, like, who is your audience, but also, like, when you're, when you're thinking about painting these, like, who is it for? You know what I mean? Hmm. Um, you know, in some ways, it's really important that these new paintings be legible by, by anyone. Like, you don't need a degree in painting to read them. If you know something about painting, you'll pick up on the references, um, the historical references. Uh, but I want them to be, to be able to go into some sort of community center. And just know, someone who knows nothing about painting would get something from them. And I also want them to go to be able to be in a museum and have them uh, stand up to and, and, and ideally um, be in a conversation with, with, with paintings that are that are in that situation. Um, I have two young children, and they shared my studio in Rome, and they've, they've seen these paintings. Um, and they ask some questions, but they generally, they generally don't, they don't think about them too much. Um, uh, I purposely hide a certain amount of the violence. I put it off screen. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to show that stuff. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, the simple answer is they're for everyone. Um, does everyone want to look at these paintings? I think a lot of people want to look at these um, less <laughs> than, than they did my, my uh, previous bodies of work. Um, so yeah, um, they're for everyone. I think this woman here had a question. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. If you, if you do have active conversations with them, could you explain? Um, they, I, my kids are nine and four. The nine-year-old um, is beginning to have an understanding of, of, generally, of some of the broad sketches of what's going on in the world. Um, my intention is not to traumatize my kids. Um, but... Uh, you know, but kids are interesting because they'll just see this as, you know, some some person who's naked, falling out of the sky. You know, um, they won't necessarily attach all the things that we've learned to attach to an image like this. Um, you know, and I'm trying to I'm trying to structure the painting so that uh, so that my kids, if they happen to see the paintings, they can interact with them in that way. Um, 
Okay, I think that might be it. Okay.